Our leaders have to get tougher. This is too tough to do it alone. But you know what? I think I'm going to be forced to. Donald Trump ready to turn his back on GOP leaders, threatening to go it alone if they fail to fall in line. We have to have our Republicans either stick together or let me just do it by myself. I'll do very well. The biting response coming after days of backlash from Republicans refusing to back Trump's proposed Muslim ban in the wake of the terror attack. Don't talk. Please be quiet. Just be quiet to the leaders because they have to get tougher. They have to get sharper. They have to get smarter. House Speaker Paul Ryan continuing to rebuke Trump's views. I actually think a a Muslim ban uh, based on religion is counterproductive to our efforts to fight terrorism. We believe in the First Amendment, which is freedom of religion. Trump touting that he can move the NRA on restricting terror suspects from buying guns after this week's terror attack. I'm going to be talking to the NRA about that and starting a real dialogue. I want to really hear what they have to say. They've endorsed me. They're terrific people. The NRA says it welcomes the meeting, but maintains its opposition to an outright ban. Trump going as far as to say that if more people were armed inside the Orlando nightclub, fewer would have died. You would have had a situation, folks, which would have been always horrible, but nothing like the carnage that we all as a people suffered. Hillary Clinton firing back, questioning Trump's legitimacy as a candidate. Not one of Donald Trump's reckless ideas would have saved a single life in Orlando. It's just more evidence that he is temperamentally unfit and and totally unqualified to be commander in chief. It's almost like time stopped. Uh, There were still things uh, and background TV is playing, uh, lights blinking, uh, drinks that have just been poured, checks are about to be paid, food half eaten. And that's not even thinking about the, the bodies on the ground. But when you actually see everyone lying down in one place or everyone down in one place or their final positions, um, it, it, you, can, you can feel it. In addition to police, fire, EMS, there's always another team that responds to tragedies the medical examiners, like Dr. Joshua Stephanie. He is speaking about this for the first time. When I heard the number 11 or 12 people deceased at the hospital from uh, one shooting, I said, that's a lot, um, but our normal staff can handle it. Then as uh, the morning went on, I started getting more texts, more calls. Then I realized the scope uh, of the disaster, or the event, uh, that numbers were starting to come in, 20 at the nightclub, 30 at the nightclub. For all of the victims, figure out cause and manner of death. That's his job. Surprisingly, the answers aren't always obvious. So law enforcement can recreate what happened. Um, So we need to get the projectiles. We need to tell them the injury pattern, entrances, exits, what they hit. You can't say for sure. Full metal jacket, hollow tip, all one. Not from from the um, fragments I recovered now. Dr. Stephanie is still piecing together the fragments from this tragedy, but he made a point to tell me no one died from trampling or other causes. No secret that all the causes are going to be the same. I mean, we all know what happened there. By Monday, he wanted all the victims identified. A lot of people had identification on them. So we'll take that ID and look at it, compare it. And if we can make a positive ID off that, we'll use that if we need other information. If the way to the person's cleaned up a little bit and recompare, that's one thing. Um, we can do what's called quick prints. We can take a thumbprint uh, hooked up to a laptop computer. Uh, run their print and see what their photos come up as and see if that can compare. Uh, we can get that family information, personal effects, tattoos. By Tuesday, he wanted all the autopsies completed. I wanted to complete our process as soon as we could and as efficient as we could so we could get those victims back with their loved ones. I think that was very important to myself and the rest of my staff. We're a public office. We serve the public. And that is, a, I think, a public mission to reunite those people with their families. Another sign of respect that you won't find in any rule book it was important for you to separate the shooter from the other victims. Myself and my staff, we just felt it was only right. There was no legal reason for it, no normal protocol for it. We just felt in our minds it was probably best, uh, ethically maybe, morally, to keep them separate. So uh, the shooter was kept, was transported by himself. He was kept in the, that other building by himself. I autopsied him by myself alone in that building, away from the, the victims, out of respect for the victims and their families. As of tonight, no one has claimed the shooter's body. 
You, you mentioned earlier that families can call you, they can talk to you, you make yourself available to them. I'm just wondering, what do you, what do you, what do you say to them? And the most common question is, did my loved one suffer? And, uh, and honestly, 99 out of 100 times, that is the question they ask. In cases such as this, I will tell them, I don't think they suffered one bit. Uh, I don't see any, I didn't see any evidence of movement or trying to struggle. It, like I said in the beginning, when, when I got in there in the scene, it's almost like everyone, everyone just stopped and laid down where they were. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN, Orlando. He was cool, stylish, and an icon of the 70s. Bjorn Borg won 11 Grand Slam titles, reached world number one, and became the sporting hero of a generation. With his model good looks and calm approach to the game, the smooth Swede created a buzz on and off the court. He was the king, and Wimbledon was his castle. Bjorn Borg reigned over this court for five consecutive years. He retired at the age of 26, and it took him almost 20 years before he returned to the All England Club. But now he's a regular guest, and he'll be sitting on centre court this year, watching the action unfold. I travelled to Stockholm for a rare chance to meet with a legend in his home country. Bjorn was upbeat, about to celebrate his 60th birthday, and finds himself back in the game, this time as a tennis parent to his 13-year-old son. So Bjorn, you're a tennis dad now. I don't see you as a typical tennis parent. Are you screaming at the back? Move your feet. <laughs> I can't <laughs> exactly. imagine Bjorn Ball doing that. No, I'm not doing that. No. <laughs> but uh, I'm a tennis dad, and uh, uh, we have a son, Leo. He just turned 13 years old, and he's playing, he's playing two, three hours every single day after school, but he's completely nuts about tennis. He has a big heart for tennis. He likes to play, he likes to compete, he likes to travel. You know, I like to stay home. You know, I'm getting a little bit older. And I, you know, we've been traveling all over the world, not only one time, but 100 times. So, but that's me as a person. But in Sweden, we travel a lot and uh, he's, he's doing pretty good, actually. The, the mo most important thing is that he enjoys tennis and he likes to play. He's winning, he's losing. But you can see all this when we're traveling uh, around Sweden, you see all this crazy parents. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, even during our time, it was people or parents who was a little bit crazy in one way. But today, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's shocking. And uh, I think that's because tennis is a sport with a lot of money involved. And uh, you can see some, sometimes the kids doesn't want to play. It's like the parents push them in to do something that they don't want to do. Bjorn lives outside of Stockholm and drives his son to school every day. He still regularly plays tennis and is actively involved in the clothing line that bears his name. To the Bjorn Borg office, I probably go maybe three times a week because I'm very interested to see what they do with the, with the design and uh, I trying uh, the, the clothing, uh, you know, if it fits good regarding, you know, how it's gonna work on the tennis court. Well, I know you're in the junior circuit a little bit with your son, but have you ever thought about going back coaching on the tour? When it comes to coaching, uh, I don't want to coach anyone. Uh, because the thing is that if you start to coach, then you have to go and travel around. You do the same thing as you did for so many years. I mean, as a, as a tennis player. So then I, w I would go nuts to sit, <laughs> to sit in the stands and watch the guys play. And I would tell myself, what the hell I'm doing here? You know, when I can... <laughs> do other things so I can be home. Yeah. So that will never, ever happen. Do you follow the tennis at all, the circuit, yes. much of the circuit at all? So how do you see the state of men's tennis right at the moment? I just love to watch these guys play today. I mean, you have Federer or Djokovic or Nadal or, or Murray or all the other guys. When they get together on the court and they have the rivalries and the great tennis they play, it's, it's you know, I, I've been watching every single match. I follow the tennis 110%. I love the way they play. And they are such a great tennis player and such a great athlete. So, and that's good for tennis. That's, tennis needs that. I think if, if we start with Federer, I mean, he's 34 years old. And, uh, you know, what he did for tennis, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, and what he's been winning. And, uh, 
I mean, up to this point, you know, the greatest player ever played the game. That's Jok a big statement, Bjorn, yeah, from you. Uh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> from you. <laughs> yeah, but I th uh, uh, that's my opinion. Djokovic, he has a chance to go all the way to uh, what Federer has been doing, or maybe pass him. You never know. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what's going to happen this year. I think he has a chance to win the Grand Slam this year. Uh, fortunately, last year he was very close to do it, but still he has still have a, uh, another chance to win the Grand Slam. So, you know, and, and you know that that's the, the most difficult thing you can do in tennis. It's almost impossible. Uh, and Wimbledon. I mean, has Federer got another chance? He, he was very close that last last year mm -hmm. twice. I think he's going to be ready for Wimbledon. He's going to play a grass court tournament before practice, and that's kind of his game. And I know that's one still is one of his goals to equal uh, Sampras' record at Wimbledon. I mean that goal he had for for the last three four years now. He wants, if it's possible, to win the gold medal at, at, at Rio. That's his biggest two goals this year. I'm sure he wants to be fit as fit as he can be. But he has, he's still playing unbelievable tennis. He can win Wimbledon because he's always playing well there. I mean, he feels like home on that court. And mm -hmm. it's going to be very interesting to see. And then uh, another thing is going to be interesting to see if he's going to play next year, Roger. Maybe this is, might be his last year. Who knows?